Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Thinking on Scripture. My name is Stephen Cook, and uh, we're going to pick up today on round number two on knowing and doing the will of God. And this study actually started a few weeks ago. I'm going to adjust my screen here just a little bit. This study started a few weeks ago uh, as I was teaching through the book of Deuteronomy. We came to an interesting section uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 17 that talks about uh, kings in Israel and the future installment of kings. And the king was to be a fellow Israelite. The king was uh, to be somebody selected by God. And there were certain prohibitions placed upon the king. The king was not to multiply horses or build up his military. Uh, the king was not to uh, multiply silver and gold uh, so as to build up his treasury. And the king was not to multiply wives, uh, and this was all to keep him humble before the Lord uh, so that he would not turn away from the Lord and turn to idolatry. And unfortunately, we know from Israel's history that that is what happened um, due to this disobedience. Uh, Solomon was probably the most notable uh, failure in this regard in that he failed all three of those negative prohibitions. He multiplied his horse uh, cavalry, his military, he multiplied gold and silver, and he multiplied wives. In fact, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and many of them being foreign wives that brought their idolatry into his household, and so they turned his heart away from the Lord. What struck my attention, though, uh, and what got me going into this particular study uh, was something that is written in Deuteronomy 17, verses 18 through uh, 20. And let me just work through this section here. It says, Now it shall come about when he, that's the king, sits on the throne of his kingdom. Now remember that Israel was a theocracy, and that meant that God was their king, he was their lawgiver, and he was their judge. So the installation of a king was really as a vice and It was somebody who served as a subordinate to God. And he wasn't the only authority in Israel. There were others uh, who held certain offices. Uh, one can think of the prophet or the judge, or the priest. And these also uh, worked under the authority of God to help lead the nation into righteousness. But it says here again in Deuteronomy 17, 18, Now it shall come about when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, uh, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. So the king had a responsibility under the Mosaic law uh, to execute this command, that he was to write out for himself a copy of this law. And this speaks of his uh, of being literate, that he could read, that he could write, and that he was to make for himself a copy of this law. And I believe that this law is a reference to the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, but he was to make a copy of this law on a scroll, and he was to do it in the presence of the Levitical priests. Now, this could imply that it was a sacred act, uh, the writing of Scripture, the copy of the law in the presence of the priests. It could also speak to an accountability that the king was to have with regard to uh, other uh, leaders in the community, and this would be the Levitical priests. But the king was to do this in the presence of the priests, and then it says that it shall be with him. So he was to carry this handwritten copy with him uh, all the days of his life. It says, and he shall read it all the days of his life. So he was to read this over and over and over again. Uh, and so this was his manual for kingship. It gave him the specific information that he needed uh, to execute his responsibilities as king. And I liken this today, perhaps, to uh, a president uh, who might uh, write out for himself uh, a copy of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and maybe do it in the presence of Congress, uh, but then to carry it with him all the days of his life and to read it, uh, that he might abide by it. And, and in effect, that's what's going on here. The king is told to write this out, to carry it with him, to read it all the days of his life. And the benefit would be that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, that he would learn to have a healthy reverence for God, a respect for God. Not only was he to learn it, to read it, to learn it, but he was to apply it. And this demonstrates the point that knowing the Word of God by itself is not sufficient. One must, where it speaks to particular commands, one must apply 
of the Word of God. Now, there are some things in the Word of God that are revelatory, that just call for us to know this, certain things about the attributes of God, the character of God, the doctrine of the Trinity. It doesn't really call for us to act in a particular way. But there are clear directives in the Word of God, and in this case, uh, there were clear directives for the king in Israel, uh, so that the king was to do certain things. He was to observe all the words of this law and the statutes. And so this demonstrates a point that I think that is found throughout Scripture, and that is that, uh, in a general sense, one cannot live what he does not know. And that knowledge of God's Word necessarily precedes living God's will. I think of in Matthew 7, 24, following, where Jesus uh, uh, compares and contrasts the, the fool and the wise man, and he says, the man who hears my words and does them. And so you have the intake of, of Scripture, of the words of Christ, and does them, the application, shall be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock, and when the storms, when the winds blew and the storms came, that his house stood. But then you have the fool, and this is the person who hears the words of Christ but does not do them. And this person's life is likened to a house that is built upon the sand, and when the storms came and the winds blew, then the house came crashing down. I think of also the passage in James 1 where James says, Do not be merely hearers of the word only, but be doers of the word also. And then at another point in James, he says, To him who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, uh, to him it is sin. And this demonstrates that one can know the Word of God in an academic sense. One can know it and yet not do it. And I would argue that every time that we sin, especially as, as advancing believers, as we come to learn the Scripture, and we know what the will of God is, that there are times where we uh, commit sin and, and we know when we're about to lie or lust or curse or, or be hateful or unforgiving or gossip or malign or, or whatever the sin happens to be, whether it's a mental attitude sin or a sin of the tongue or, uh, again, a, a, an overt sin or a covert sin or whatever the classification is. We know at these times when we are about to sin. Uh, but again, it's one of those things where one can know the Word and not live it, and I think Solomon is probably, again, the classic example of that, that here was a man who was uh, the wisest man who ever lived. He knew the Word of God tremendously. He wrote three books of the Bible. He wrote uh, uh, Song of Solomon, Ecclesi uh, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, and yet even though he knew the Word, he did not abide by it, and, and I think that this goes to show that a believer can, in fact, know the Word and not walk in it. But again, here he was to write it out, he was to carry it with him, and that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing or doing all the words of this law and these statutes. And he says, and another benefit would be that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, that he would not become prideful and, and think that he was better than everybody else, that everybody else was just there to serve him, that he would see himself as a servant of the Lord. Uh, who was to do the Lord's will and to lead his people in righteousness and in humility, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, so he was not to deviate. And there was an added benefit to this, so that he and his sons may live long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. And so if the king was willing to abide uh, by the commands of God's word, then it would prove not only be, to be a blessing to him, but also to his, uh, to his children, to his sons. So this launched me into, well, how do we as Christians know the will of God for ourselves? And that's part of what this study is, and I'm covering this in somewhat of a broad way, although we will deal with some particulars. Now, last time I went through, and I'm going to cover this very briefly, we hit on the subject of general revelation and special revelation. General revelation is that knowledge that we have that God exists. Uh, Psalm 19.1 says the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Uh, Romans chapter 1, really starting back in verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And this speaks of the heart that is turned away from the Lord, the heart that is negative to God. And it's not that God isn't clearly known through the creation. He is. The Scripture is quite clear on this. Uh, 
the issue becomes really uh, that people who are negative to the Lord uh, will suppress that truth in unrighteousness. He says, because that which is known, not a guessing game, that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. So God has made himself evident within them that every person knows that God exists, that when they when they begin to grow and they come to a place of self-consciousness in their development, and it's different for each person, it could be 8 or 9 or 10 or 13, I think it depends on, on your upbringing and uh, cultural development and uh, you know whether or not your mind is functioning properly, but I think it's different for each people, but they come to a place of God consciousness. Now, uh, Paul here makes it clear that, uh, that that which is known about God is evident within them, for God himself made it evident to them. And now if God makes something evident to somebody, then it is evident. Now what they're going to do is they're going to suppress that, they're going to squash that information. Uh, but God himself made it evident to them. John Calvin uh, used to refer to this as the census divinitatis, uh, and I've taught on this before. I have a short video on this, as a matter of fact, uh, and it's the idea that every person has a sense of the divine, and again, they will suppress that information. Now, and there may be situations in life that may cause that to pop up, and then they have to wrestle with that again. Now, if they turn positive at some future time, then they'll turn to Christ as Savior and, and submit themselves to the Lord. But if they're still operating on negative volition, then they will seek to suppress that information and jam it back down. Uh, Romans 1.20, For since the creation of his world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made, that is, through the creation, so that they, that is, those who suppress the truth, are without excuse. And when I'm talking with an unbeliever, I never try to prove the existence of God. God has made himself known. I don't, I don't have to argue that point. He has made himself known through nature, and he has made himself known, he has made himself evident within them. Now, they have suppressed that information, and I know that it's jammed down in there somewhere, but I live in the reality that they know that God exists. Now, they can go through all sorts of mental and verbal uh, gymnastics and jump through all sorts of hoops to try to suppress that information, uh, but if they're negative to God, then, well, you can't reverse that negative volition. That's something that is within each person. Now, apart from general revelation, we talked about special revelation, how God is made known through his word. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God, pasagrafe the apnustos. The apnustos there being uh, God breathed, speaking about the very breath of God, which I believe implies a very closeness to God. Uh, to get to the scripture, and by the way, the word grafe there refers to written scripture. This is not the spoken word. This is the written word. But all scripture is God-breathed. It originates from God. But to be close to God, one must come to the word of God. And coming to the word of God, you are as near to God as his breath. And that implies a level of intimacy there. 2 Peter uh, 1.21 says, For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And uh, this is the point that God the Holy Spirit superintended the writers of Scripture in such a way that he moved in, in, in their mind in such a way and in their, um, in their writings in such a way that without compromising their own personality or choice of words or literary style, that what they produced in the end was exactly what God intended for them to produce. And it was, in fact, the word of God and not merely the word of man. We also talked about how special revelation comes through his son, uh, which Ephesians 1, 1 and 2, excuse me, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Now, uh, when Christ was upon the earth, he was a special revelation. There were things that he said and things that he did that revealed uh, the Father, that revealed God to mankind. And he is God himself. Remember that at a point in time, the second member of the Trinity, God the Son, 
added humanity to himself in theology. This is called the doctrine of the hypostatic union, which teaches that undiminished deity was combined together forever with perfect humanity. But when Christ was upon the earth, uh, when he walked among men uh, and he offered the kingdom, uh, to Israel, because he is uh, he was born in the line of David. He is, in fact, the king of Israel. He's also a prophet, a priest, uh, and uh, he was a teacher. He had different roles that he served in. Uh, but nonetheless, everything that he said and everything that he did was a perfect revelation of God to man. Uh, and so now Christ has been ascended. He went to the cross. He died a substitutionary death in our place. Uh, bearing the punishment for our sins, dying in our place, uh, that we might have forgiveness of sins and eternal life and the gift of righteousness by simply trusting in Christ as Savior. It's quite simple. Very costly. It costs God his Son, uh, but it is quite simple for us to simply turn to him by faith and faith alone uh, to trust in Christ as Savior because man needs only Christ uh, to be saved. But nonetheless, after his death, burial, and resurrection, he ascended back into heaven or he ascended to heaven, and Acts 1.9 makes this clear, and so he is now seated in heaven. So we do not have the personal presence of Christ that we can see that special revelation. So what we have is we have the Word of God. So today we have the written Word of God, which provides the clearest revelation of his will, and apart from his Word, we have no clear understanding of who God is, what he is doing, or what he expects of us. What I love about the Word of God is just like the king in Israel— when the king in Israel wrote down a copy of the law for himself, this was something that had been verbalized uh, by Moses and written down, which means that it was inscripturated, it became scripture. But when the king wrote it down, uh, he could rely upon the accuracy of the text. He could rely upon the meaning of words as they were communicated by the original author, uh, that is Moses, in that he infused meaning into the words by the words that he selected and by uh, the choice of, of words and the grammatical structure of the sentences. In other words, meaning lies in the text itself as the author intended uh, words to mean certain things. And so this implies the integrity of language through centuries. And so a king that sits upon the throne centuries later could still pick up this copy of the text and could read it and understand exactly what God meant. And there wasn't any confusion about it. It wasn't ambiguity. And this demonstrates that meaning is not found in the reader. Uh, meaning is found in the author uh, by the selection of words and by the structure of the sentences to communicate meaning. And this shows that, uh, that language is a reliable vehicle for the expression of ideas. Now, we did a word study. We looked at some words. I'm not going to look back over that. I do very briefly in this uh, review, which is what I'm doing here, uh, demonstrate that positive volition is really the key to unlocking the scriptures. Jesus made a very profound comment in John 17, 17. He said, if anyone is willing to do his will, now that speaks of positive volition. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. And, and don't miss this. This is a very important truth that positive volition uh, precedes knowing uh, the will of God, knowing the, the teaching of scriptures. Talking about those who were negative, he spoke to the Pharisees and he said, why do you not understand what I am saying to you? It is because you cannot hear my word, not just will not, but cannot understand. And Jesus gave the answer saying, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. So here, negative volition uh, handicapped them from knowing the truth. Uh, Paul described this in, in Romans 1.18, that those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And then a, another very important verse in 1 Corinthians 2.14, where uh, it reads here, but an unbeliever or a natural man, or uh, the Greek says the psuchikos man, the soulish man, this is the man who is devoid of the Holy Spirit. And really at, at that time, being devoid of the Holy Spirit, uh, he is uh, uh, deficient. He lacks the capacity. Now, in one sense, he can academically understand what the text says, but he can never accept it as truth or authoritative in his life. He will reject it as foolishness. And so the unbeliever does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot 
understand them. So again, that negative volition and that being in that unregenerate state uh, puts a handicap upon the mind of that person to really know the truth. Now, the person who uh, is positive to the Lord wants to know his word. David says, I delight to do your will. Oh, my God, your law is within my heart. Your law is within my heart. I love this description by Jeremiah where he says, your words were found and I ate them. And a picture of uh, consumption of taking in something that has a nutritional benefit to it. Your words were found and I ate them and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. Now... Uh, at another point here, uh, God will open his word to the believer who dedicates his or her life to him. And this speaks of uh, the presenting of our bodies to God as a living and holy sacrifice so that you may prove what the will of God is. And this demonstrates a point, again, that the will of God can be known, that it can be ascertained, and this through the scriptures. So let me kind of move on here a little bit. And uh, one last point here, and I, I love this one too, because this speaks of the experiential aspect of Christianity, that God's Word is powerful and accomplishes what He desires, and it lights a fire in the heart of those who welcome it. For example, Jesus, after His resurrection, walked for several miles with two disciples and gave them a Bible lesson, which lasted for several hours as they traveled, uh, Luke tells us, to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And Luke records that Jesus taught them, saying, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And I, and I love this because Jesus supernaturally blinded their eyes to see who he was. Uh, but then in his walk with them, he points them to the scriptures. He points them to the Word of God, to the Bible. And he begins to work through, uh, the, through Moses and the prophets and explaining the scriptures to them. Now, after the Bible lesson, his Bible lesson, the two disciples said, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? So again, the heart that is positive to God receives his word and is excited by what is learned. So now let's move into uh, these various theological categories that I have written out here. Um, and these notes are going to condensed version. This is probably about 10 pages in the in the written version. They were almost double that when I was working on the notes. Uh, but after about 20 hours of study, I finally had to put a, put a bow on it and just kind of tighten it up a little bit. So, so this is where we are. And, and I'll unpack these theological categories as we work through here. I, I'm hoping to get through the first two today. We'll see. We'll see how far we get. So the will of God can be divided between his secret will and his revealed will. And this very interesting passage in Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, uh, that we may observe all the words of this law. So there are secret things uh, that God has not revealed. Uh, and as I mentioned before, that what God has revealed in the Scripture is what He deems important for us to know. Now, what God has revealed in Scripture is what he deems important for us to know, but there are secret things that belong to the Lord, and he remains silent. To spend our days pursuing that which God has decreed to keep secret will result in unending frustration. If we have prayed and studied God's Word thoroughly and received no answer to prayer, then it's either because he does not want us to know or to know at this time. And this was something I came to understand some years ago, that sometimes when God is silent about a matter, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have an answer or not that he doesn't want me to know something. It's that at that time, uh, he doesn't want me to know that there are some things that he just keeps secret. Uh, and so, again, to spend our days pursuing that which God has decreed uh, uh, to keep secret will, end in, will result in unending frustration. Uh, let's see, we may, we may, through our daily experiences, seek to determine God's will for us. However, such providential understanding must always be subordinate to God's written revelation. And I can pray. I can pray for God to open a door. I can pray for God to move providentially, and He does. There's times where He will open doors and close doors, and He will make uh, His will known uh, by various channels that He may open in my life. Uh, and so, again, one may, uh, through daily experiences, seek to determine God's will. Uh, 
uh, but always being mindful that such providential understandings must always be subordinate to God's written revelation. Though we don't know many particulars about what God is doing, we know that He is in control and directing history to the return of Christ into the eternal state. And we are part of that grand plan, and that's important to understand, um, that we are part of God's plan. And really, before we came to faith in Christ, we were uh, spending our time being exposed to a lot of human viewpoint, and our minds were becoming saturated with, uh, with human viewpoint thinking. And we were operating really on a basis of uh, self-centeredness, uh, by and large. But when we come to faith in Christ, when we understand the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised again on the third day, and that when we come with the empty hands of faith and we trust in Christ as Savior, uh, then at that moment, having trusted in him, uh, we are forgiven all of our sins, and we are given eternal life and the gift of righteousness and a spiritual gift, and we are transferred from being in Adam to being in Christ. We are transferred from Satan's kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the beloved Son. And we have to grow into these things. We have to study the Word of God, and we have to grow into these truths with regard to who we are. And we have a very high calling in Christ. Um, in fact, I recently did an article on great, uh, what it means to be great and least in the kingdom of heaven. And the believer who knows the Word and lives the Word uh, will, in the eternal state, receive a classification of being great in the kingdom of heaven. But the believer who disobeys the Word uh, and teaches others to do the same, as Matthew 5.19 clearly states, uh, that person will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But the point is, is that as we begin to grow in our knowledge of the Word of God, uh, that we begin to uh, take in this understanding of our new identity and what it means to be in Christ. And this is a very powerful thing because we realize that we become children of God, we become brothers and sisters to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we take on a new identity that is rooted in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this comes with a tremendous uh, portfolio of spiritual assets as Ephesians 1.3 makes clear that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And we can spend years, decades, unpacking the Scripture and what exactly that means. Uh, Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer, uh, in his Systematic Theology, set forth 33 things uh, that happen at the moment of faith in Christ. And that is worth taking the time to study. I've taught on that before, but that is a, a very good study. But the point is, is that we begin to understand that we are in the plan of God, that He is moving circumstances, that He is uh, moving history in such a way. And God can make tiny little variations in your life. He can make tiny adjustments uh, that, uh, that can change the overall trajectory of your life. And He's thinking long term. Uh, he's dealing with things on a very small level, and it really becomes amazing to think that God knows everything about us. I mean, He knows my thoughts before I think them. He knows my words before I speak them. He knows when I sit down. He knows when I rise up. He knows how many hairs are on my head, and every day I lose hair, every day I grow hair. And not just me, but He's aware of seven billion other people on the planet. He's aware of every bird in the sky, every fish in the sea, every flower in the field, every grain of sand upon the seashore, and, and not just in the moment, but in the past, in the future, and not just on this planet, but on billions of other planets uh, in our galaxy and in the universe. There's, what, between one and two hundred billion galaxies in the known universe. And to think that God knows it all, past, present, and future, and not only the actual, but the probable, well, that just staggers the imagination to try to even lay hold of such profound truths. And yet the believer realizes that God isn't just aware, but he's actively involved in everything that happens in our life. You know, there's this idea from, a, uh, from atheists uh, who operate on anti-supernaturalistic presuppositions and argue that mankind lives in a closed universe. That is, that there's no outside uh, person or, or force or anything acting upon the universe. And that basically we're left here to kind of slug it out and do the best we can with what we have. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches we live in an open universe, that God is very involved in our affairs and everyday activities. And I love passages like Proverbs 16.33, which says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. 
So the roll of the dice may be done by a person. I lived in Vegas for 10 years, so I saw a lot of dice rolled. Uh, and this was back in the 80s. But to realize that the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord, speaks of his uh, ultimate involvement, such that the role of those dice are ultimately determined by God himself, so that what seems to us to be to mere, to be mere chance is ultimately under his sovereign control. And when we understand that God moves in certain affairs, that he controls even meteorological patterns, Think of when Jonah was fleeing from the presence of the Lord and God uh, caused a wind to blow and created a storm that stopped Jonah while he was out on the sea. Or think about how God uh, uh, controls prosperity, agricultural uh, prosperity and adversity. He causes uh, a prosperity, but he also caused famines. Think of Joseph, where Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, uh, attacked, sold into slavery down into Egypt. And while he was there... Uh, he interpreted a dream that God gave to Pharaoh, uh, and it was the seven fat cows that were eaten by the seven skinny cows. And the interpretation of it was, as God gave it to Joseph, was that God was going to cause seven years of prosperity, followed by seven years of famine. Well, all of this was intended by God to control uh, the climatological uh, situation, uh, in, in this region of the world, in Egypt and in the land of Canaan, in order that in the second year of the famine, if you read through Genesis 37 to 50, that Joseph's father, Jacob, and his brothers, who are up in Canaan, and the other members of the household, 70 in all, uh, in the second year of the famine become hungry. And all they know is that they are being moved by hunger pains. Uh, but remember that back in Genesis 15, God had made a uh, given a word to Abram that his descendants would be strangers in a foreign land for 400 years. Well, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then you have his 12 sons. But uh, God is going to move them down into Egypt, and he's going to cause a famine. He, he, he caused seven years of prosperity, followed by seven years of famine, to move them geographically down into Egypt. And once they come down into Egypt, then the prophetic clock begins ticking, and 400 years pass, and then Moses shows up on the scene. But the point is, is that God moves the circumstances of our life. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is important to understand, that we live in a world that God controls. And so he is moving in such a way so as to direct our lives uh, to an end that he has uh, determined that we are to, to go. And I realize that when somebody cuts me off on the freeway, that God could have caused that to happen. He could have, or he could have allowed that to happen. But either way, it's under his sovereign control. And that tiny little adjustment in my life, that little five-second slowdown that occurred there, could be enough of a tiny uh, shift in my life, a tiny little variation that 10 years from now could determine my running into somebody, a meeting with another person, in which they will need to hear gospel information, and I will be able to share that with them, and they will come to faith in Christ. And I liken that. Uh, I enjoy shooting. I go out to the range on occasion. Haven't been in a while. But uh, but if I'm out on the range, and you know, if I'm shooting my pistol, or, or let's say I'm shooting a rifle, tiny little variations that I can make, tiny little adjustments to, um, you know, to the scope, or I, you know, looking down range. But those tiny little adjustments can have long range impact. And for those who shoot, you know what I'm talking about. But it communicates the idea that little adjustments here and there that God does in our life, whether that's through a, a, a weather pattern or through something that he's doing agriculturally or politically or, or economically or any one of a number of things in which God is moving behind the scenes to structure our world, he's directing our lives. But this gives us a sense of confidence because even though we don't know what tomorrow holds, we know who holds tomorrow. And we have absolute confidence in him. And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. And we can know that we have purpose and meaning in this world because the infinite personal creator God has, has given that to us. And we are part of his grand plan. And we are helping him to execute this. And he's involving us in this. And this gives us a personal sense of destiny that becomes really quite powerful in the mind of the believer and elevates us to a place of, of living and significance in this world.
that is connected with the infinite personal creator God who brought us into being. And this is, this is again, profound to think about these things. So anyway, I'm chasing a rabbit trail here, but let's get back to the text here. So concerning God's revealed will, the following classifications are noted. Now I'm going to set forth five in this study, and I'm not sure if, I was thinking this will be a three-part series, but the way it's looking now, it could be four or five. Uh, we'll just see uh, how much progress we make. So concerning uh, these uh, theological categories, let's, let's look at the first one, which is God's sovereign will. God's sovereign will. And we want to start with God. This is obviously biblically and logically the place to start. But God's sovereign real will refers to his free and independent choices to do whatever he pleases. To do whatever he pleases. And one can think of like back in Genesis 1, when God created the heavens and the earth. He didn't consult anybody. He acted freely. This is his sovereign will. He chose to create. He chose to bring the universe into existence and the earth into existence. But again, God is acting sovereignly here. In Isaiah 41.10, God says, My purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. And he says in Daniel 4.35 that all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, What have you done? Psalm 135 verse 6 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth and in the seas and in all the deeps. So notice again that whatever he pleases, he does in heaven and in earth. So this again shows an open universe. It shows God very involved in his universe, in the earth, in the seas and in all the deeps. And Ephesians 1.11 says that he works all things after the counsel of his will. Now, God remains in constant sovereign control, guiding his creation through history. He meddles in the affairs of mankind, and his unseen hand works behind all their activities, controlling and directing history as he wills. We know from Scripture that God possesses certain immutable attributes, and immutable just simply means unchanging. But He can, He possesses certain immutable attributes that He that and that He never acts inconsistently with His nature. So even though God is sovereign, there are certain uh, attributes about Him uh, that we might say uh, serve as I hate to use the word controls, but uh, but serve as uh, as as the things that drive his, his, his behavior. So again, we know from scripture that God possesses certain immutable attributes that he never acts and that he never acts inconsistently with his nature. Let me give an example. For example, God is righteous. We know this from the scriptures and all his commands are just uh, because God is immutable. Uh, that is never changing. We know that his moral perfections never change. Because God is eternal, uh, he is righteous forever. Because God is omniscient, his righteous acts are always predicated on perfect knowledge. Because God is omnipotent, he is always able to execute his righteous will. Because God is love, his judgments can be merciful toward the undeserving and humble. And so we see how God's attributes work in perfect harmony with each other. And, uh, and so we'll see this as we work through uh, this particular study. So uh, not only that, but God controls who sits in positions of power on the earth, whether they hold that position by birth or by democratic vote. Daniel 2.21 uh, reveals to us that ultimately it is God who changes the times and the seasons, that he removes kings and he establishes kings. And Daniel 4.17 says, For the Most High is ruler over the, over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. It's interesting to me uh, that I've been teaching through sections of, um, of Jeremiah, and it's a book that I've wanted to teach through, but um, I've been reluctant to get into. It's uh, quite a large book, not that I'm opposed to that, uh, but I've been wanting to do other studies, Deuteronomy and other studies, before I get into Jeremiah. But there's a passage in Jeremiah 25 in which God refers to uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he calls him my servant. And what fascinates me about that particular uh, reference there in, in Jeremiah 
is that Nebuchadnezzar, at the time when God says this, Nebuchadnezzar was an unbeliever. He was, uh, he was a pagan, idolatrous king, and yet God raised him uh, to be this ruler in Babylon in order that he might serve as God's disciplinary agent against Judah, against his people who were engaging in a gross sin, even sacrificing their own children. It was absolutely horrible. And yet God calls him my servant, And this shows that God controls, again, all people as far as who sits in positions of power. When Israel turned negative to God, uh, he judged them uh, by placing weak leaders over them. Isaiah 3, 4, uh, God says, I will make mere lads their princes and capricious children will rule over them. So God says, okay, well, you want to turn away from me and you want to pursue your own ways and act like children? Fine. Fine. I will raise up children to rule over you. And he describes them as capricious children. In Isaiah 3.12, uh, the result was that those who guide you lead you astray and confuse the direction of your paths. And I, when I look at uh, the political landscape here in America, and this is uh, day two of 2022, we've just moved into a new year, and I look at some of the uh, political leaders that we have in our country, and I wonder if we are not under divine discipline. I wonder if God is not giving us exactly what we deserve in our country uh, because we have so turned away from the Lord and we have uh, failed in many ways as a nation quite horribly. I've discussed this in other lessons. In fact, I uh, gave a lesson as to why God judges nations and I also did a series of lessons on where Satan is attacking in America, uh, which I think are relevant to to this particular uh, discussion. Now, God even controls hostile unbelievers to accomplish his purposes. In fact, Proverbs 16, 4 says, The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked, for the day of evil. And this is hard for us sometimes to understand, or difficult in some ways as well, that God will actually use wicked unbelievers to accomplish his will. And yet, remember that God is sovereign, that he raises up kings, he removes kings, Uh, And he elevates people and removes people based on his sovereign will. For example, when Jesus was on trial, uh, Pilate falsely thought that he had control over him. And Pilate told Jesus in John 19 to 10, he says, Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Now, that's a pretty bold statement. I think that Pilate was operating from a a place of confidence, albeit pseudo-confidence. He was operating on human viewpoint and not divine viewpoint. But Jesus, who was operating on divine viewpoint, said to Pilate, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. And so Jesus had the correct viewpoint. He had the divine viewpoint on the situation. And he knew that uh, that Pilate was in that position of authority and that Pilate would cave to the demands of the mob that was crying out for them, uh, that was crying out for him to crucify Jesus. And uh, and so uh, Jesus knew that Pilate would fail as a political leader, uh, in this case as a judge, that he would uh, in part be responsible for the greatest miscarriage of justice in the history of the human race. And yet even though uh, even though Pilate is going to participate in this along with Herod and, and Gentiles and, and Jews at the time, uh, that cumulatively God was using them to accomplish his purposes of putting Christ upon the cross, that he might die uh, a substitutionary death, that he might on the cross accomplish his will. And remember, Jesus was not murdered. He said quite plainly in John 10, he said, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down. And he said, I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. And so Jesus willingly went to the cross, uh, and he laid down his life as a substitutionary atoning sacrifice for you, for me. And again, he used these wicked political leaders to accomplish that. I love this section in here, that while praying to God, Peter and John acknowledged God's sovereignty over the Gentile rulers, And they said, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. 
So here we see the coalescence of human and divine will, and yet the human will is operating in a state of sin and hostility towards God and Christ, and yet even their sinful actions were used by God to put Christ upon the cross who would die as a substitute for their sins and the sins of everybody in the past and the sins of everybody in the future. This is the brilliance of God. This is the genius of God. I mean, he's God. I mean, he can accomplish these sorts of things such that even the sinfulness of man does not defeat the sovereignty of God. So for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, stop here. And uh, next time we gather back, we will move into uh, discussing God's directive will. Now, I am doing uh, podcasts as well, and the podcasts will not follow the videos uh, exactly, although the content is still the same, and much of what I'm saying is the same. Uh, I will cover it in different chunks. But at this point, I'm going to stop here uh, with regard to understanding the first category of, uh, of knowing and doing the will of God, and starting with the will of God as it pertains to his sovereignty. So I hope this lesson has been helpful to you and that you have benefited from this. Uh, if you enjoy this video and would like to receive others like it, then be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel or my Rumble channel. They're both called Thinking on Scripture. I have a, po I have a, a podcast also called Thinking on Scripture. And I also have a blog, guess what, called Thinking on Scripture, because that's what I spend a lot of my time doing and have done for probably the last 30 plus years is spending a lot of my time thinking upon Scripture. And so I thought it would be appropriate to name my channels the same. So, And I also do appreciate comments. So if you'd like to leave a comment below, uh, I do respond to those. I do appreciate those. So I thank you for taking the time to watch this video, and I hope that this has been helpful to you, and I wish you a blessed day.